Section 4. Confidential Transactions Every asset in Elements benefits from confidential transactions by default. In this section, you'll learn how to create a confidential address, send assets to it using confidential transactions, how transaction amounts and asset types are blinded with a blinding key, and how to use a blinding key to unblind values within a confidential transaction. You will need to get two elements nodes, E1 and E2, running in order to follow along. Here I've aliased the element CLI for each to E1 CLI and E2 CLI, as described in section 3. So, just to demonstrate that, I have aliased E1 CLI to communicate with the first elements node, as well as E2 CLI to communicate with the second elements node. All right, let me clear my screen so that the rest of the commands are easier to see. In order to demonstrate confidential transactions, we'll have E2 send itself some funds and then try to view the transaction from E1. This will demonstrate the confidential nature of transactions and elements. All right. Every new address generated by an elements node is confidential by default. We can demonstrate this by getting E2 to generate a new address. So, to do this, we can type E2CLI, get new address. We're going to be using this address a lot throughout this tutorial. So, let's assign this address to a variable named address. All right, I've run the command, and now I can view this address by outputting it to the screen. Here we can see that the address starts with EL1. This identifies it as a confidential address. We can also examine the address in more detail using the get address info command. Let's try that with E2CLI, get address info. And here we'll just pass in that address. All right, so right away we see a whole bunch of information about the address. Right here you can see a confidential key property. And this indicates to us that this is indeed a confidential address. The confidential key is a public blinded key, which is added to the confidential address. This is the reason why a confidential address is so long. This address also has an associated unconfidential address. Should you wish to use regular, non-confidential transactions within elements, you should send assets to this address instead of the one with the EL1 prefix. And as you can see, this one has a different prefix. So to summarize, there are two separate addresses here, one which is unconfidential and one which is confidential. All right, we can now have E2 send some funds to this address that it has generated. This will later demonstrate that E1, since it's not one of the transacting parties, will not be able to view the details of the transaction. Okay, let me clear the screen to make these subsequent commands easier to see, and let's do just that. So let's type E2CLI, send to address, and then we'll just pass in that address. Sorry. I forgot we also need to provide a value. So the value we will provide is 0 0.1 BTC. Perfect. So now we have sent 0 0.1 BTC to this address. And this is the corresponding ID of the transaction which has done the sending. Let's save this transaction amount to a variable. 
because we're going to be using this quite a bit as well throughout the rest of this tutorial. All right, so now if we just output the contents of this TXID variable, we'll see that it actually has now been assigned to this transaction ID. All right, let's clear the screen once again. Next, we want to confirm this transaction. So let's generate 101 blocks to confirm it. We can do this with the generate command, like so. Perfect. Now we have confirmed the transaction. We can view the transaction, which as a reminder, has seen AE2 send some funds to itself. We can view it from E2's perspective by using E2 CLI. So here we will run E2 CLI, get transaction, and we will just pass in that TX ID. Let's scroll up here because this is a lot of information. And what we'll see is a bunch of details. Some of these details are quite interesting. So we can see that 0.1 BTC was sent and 0.1 BTC was received. We can also see the ID of the asset which was transacted. We can also see these amount blinder and asset blinder properties. And these are used to blind the details of the transaction from other nodes which were not involved in this transaction. Let's confirm that this actually worked. So let's check the details of the same transaction from E1's perspective and see if it's able to see the amounts and the asset types. So to do this, we need to, let me just clear the screen. We have to get the raw transaction details because E1, um, yeah, we, we have to get the raw transaction details. So uh, we can do it with this get raw transaction command and we will pass in the TX ID. This will just return a very, very large hex stream. We will not have any use for that hex string. So instead, let's just decode that result right away. So we can do that with the decode raw transaction. And now we can see what E1 sees when it comes across this transaction. All right, so E1 sees a whole bunch of information. Right here, we can see some V out sections, which correspond to those uh, outputs that we saw earlier, that output. But what we can see, which is quite interesting, is that the values, the value is actually a range. We can't see an exact value. And we see an asset commitment, but we don't see the actual asset itself. This is for the first two outputs. There's a range and there is an asset commitment, but no asset. And then here we just see a fee output, which is non-confidential since it's just the fee. So that's quite interesting. We made a transaction from E2 to itself and E1 cannot actually see the amounts and the uh, asset type. Now what's interesting is that even if we were to import E2's private key into E1's wallet, E1 would still not be able to see the amounts and type of asset transacted. This is because it has no knowledge of the blinding key that was used by E2. So I'm not just going to tell you this, let's actually prove it. So we can prove this by importing the private key that E2 used into the wallet of E1. So before we do this, we first have to actually export the private key from E2. So let's do that. E2 CLI. Dump private key, dump priv key for that address. And here we can see the private key that E2 used for that address. And let's import it into E1. I just copied and pasted that same address and now I will import it. Perfect. Now that we have imported the private key, we can actually use the much simpler get transaction command. So let's try that. E1 CLI, 
get transaction px id. So let's run that. And right away, I can see that this output looks a bit different than what we saw from E2's perspective, despite E1 knowing of E2's private key for this address. We don't actually see the amount, we see a zero. So that's quite interesting. Um, and uh, this is actually the full um, raw transaction here, so we can try decoding that as well. I'll just paste that in. And similarly, we can see right here that um, the values for all these outputs are still ranges. They are unknown. So that's interesting. We have imported the private key for this address, and we still can't see the amounts and the asset type. So what do we have to do in order for E1 to know uh, the confidential information for this address? Well, we actually need the blinding key for the address. So let's dump the blinding key for the address with the dump blinding key command for um, from E2. So we can do that. And this is the blinding key. Let's copy that and import it into E1. So import blinding key. We'll tell it which address it's for. And then we will actually provide the blinding key and it will get imported. Cool. Now we can run the exact same command E1CLI get transaction. And we can pass in the TX ID. And we can scroll up and see that now the amount is actually shown. It's 0 0.1 Bitcoin. So we have unblinded this amount for E1. And right here in the details, we can see the asset ID and the amount. So all of a sudden we have all the information we had when we viewed this transaction from E2. In this section, we've seen something interesting. We've seen that the use of a blinding key hides the amount and type of assets in a transaction, and that by importing the right blinding key, we can reveal those values. In practical use, a blinding key may, for example, be given to an auditor. Should there be a need to verify the amounts and types of assets held by a party? The confidential transactions feature of elements also allows for range proofs to be performed. Range proofs can prove that an amount of an asset is held within a given range without the need to expose the actual amount itself. We've also seen that confidential transactions are optional, but they are enabled by default when a new address is generated.